Hello, so let's start learning about stars and the universe. So uh, today's lecture is mainly about stars and the star class classification like H using HR diagrams. So a fixed luminous point in the night sky that is large, um, a remote celestial body like the sun, right? So when you're looking at the sky, you see this a nice distribution of stars, right? Now we are living in a um, urban area, so it's hard to see a really um, bright stars in the sky because it's dimming due to the street lights and the other building lights. However, if you able to go to a little bit rural area and uh, observe the sky, it should be a nice uh, shiny sky sky with a lot of uh, bright stars and even we can recognize a lot of different colors of these stars. Well, um, so her main thing is those stars are very similar to the sun that we see uh, every day in the sky. So mainly how does these suns make energy? So um, now we know um, little bit more details about stars and how these stars are making their energy. So uh, the, the reaction, what we call nuclear fusion, um, converts hydrogen atoms into helium. In that procedure, uh, these stars are making energy. So the byproduct of nuclear fusion in the sun's core is a massive volume of energy volume of energy that gets released and radiates outward toward the surface of the sun and then it gets spread into the solar system and beyond. So when you're measuring the stars for general people that who don't know anything about the stars and especially when you're not really interested in observing the sky, we would say, oh, they look all alike, right? But if you're being a little bit careful, you can distinguish these stars. So some stars look bright and some are faint. Sometimes that's due to them being at different distances, but it's also true that the stars emit different amounts of light. So the distance to the star or the powerfulness of the star will define the brightness that it looks in the sky. So if you look through a binocular or a take picture of them, you will see that they, are, uh, they all are different colors as well. So some stars appear white, some red in color, uh, some are orange, even blue. And for a long time, the re reason for this was a mystery. So we didn't know anything about having different color stars in the sky. But now we know why it is just so. So in the late 80s, we were only just started, started uh, to figure out uh, interpreting stellar spectra. So in this uh, diagram, you see the stellar spectrum uh, with um, combination of absorption spectrum and emission spectrum. I believe you know what it is right now because we have learned those in the previous lectures. Uh, and this graph is the relative brightness versus the wavelength. Uh, of the stars, right? So you will be observing the variation of intensity and then uh, we can decide like what's going on with the temperatures and the colors in the stars. So the spectrums that we measure from a star is a combination of two different kinds of spectra. One is the stars are hot, then the dense balls of gas. So they give off a continuous spectrum. That is, they emit light at all wavelengths like our, the white light that we receive. So that is a continuous spectrum where we see all the seven colors uh, and, a mix, uh, and when we mixing all these colors, we see it as a uh, white color light. Then the stars also have atmosphere, uh, thinner layers of gas above the denser inner layers. So these gases absorb light at specific wavelength from the light below, depending on the elements in there. Uh, so the result is that the continuous spectrum of a star has gaps in it. 
darker bands where different elements absorb different colors. So these are absorption spectra. So if you look at the spectrum closely, uh, do you see these black color lines? So those are uh, absorption spectra. So by reading the spectrum, we can understand or recognize the elements in the star. Again, a nice cool picture of stars, collection of stars. So the brightness of a star depends on both distance and its luminosity. So let's learn about luminosity in the next um, slides. So how far away are these stars? That's a good question. So we don't know how far they are, but when you're looking at the sky, we see like it is in a fabric around us in a kind of same distance to us, but it really knows. These stars are lying way different distances than what we see. So these star distances, uh, so the basic idea here is the closer objects shift in the direction through a bigger angle than uh, the other stars does. So uh, we call this as the stellar parallax. Let's try one thing. Before we move into stellar parallax, let's understand what is a parallax is. Look at this number line. You may take, uh, close your left eye and then keep your um, pointy finger in front of your right eye, about eight centimeters away from this, uh, the uh, eye, and then align your finger with one of the numbers. So let's say you're closing your left eye, then you keep your a pointy finger in front of your eye, a little bit closer to your eye, and then you align that one with number one, number two, let's say number two. And then you close your right eye while opening the left eye. What did you notice? Have you noticed that your uh, alignment of the number have shifted? So for me, it shifted to five, uh, the indicator. Then what you have to do is, Again, close the right eye, open the left eye, and keep your thumb a little bit away from your eye and align number two. Then close your left eye and open the right eye. So what did you notice? Did you notice a shift, but a relatively smaller shift uh, compared to what you have observed earlier? Right? So that's called the parallax. So apparent shift of the location of the object right so when we are observing a closer object the shift is larger but when you're observing an object that stays far away the shift is smaller so stellar parallax that means the parallax that you observed in the stars right so here uh, this shift happens due to the location of the earth with respect to the sun so you know like every year the earth is revolving around the sun uh, so let's say we are looking at a star which is a nearby star uh, in january so you'll be seeing a star in this direction and then later after six months later in july we are observing the same star but it is in the other way around so relative to the distant stars this star the location has shifted so here you may see the view of the sky in january so whatever the, the this interesting star that nearby to us is located somewhere here but when you're observing the sky in july the star has shifted this way so that's called the uh, parallax shift so this star is nearby star so that's why you see a big shift here but if you look at the other stars, they have not shifted that much, um, isn't it? So if you see the other stars, they are not shifted that, that much. That's because those stars are further away than the, this star. So the further away stars, the parallax shift is smaller. All right, so the, uh, we know that the distance is measured in astronomical units. Um, so we can calculate the distance of, to the star by taking the astronomical unit divided by parallax angle. So by doing that calculation, we can calculate the distance to the stars. Now here, we are defining a different unit. We call this as the per sec. So per sec is the 
the distance that a star makes when it's creating a one arc sec over here. The, if the parallax shift is one arc sec, then the distance to the star from the sun is one per sec. And one per sec is equal to 260, 206,265 uh, astronomical unit. So using this unit or the changing to this unit to measure the distances, it's giving us an opportunity to measure the far away distances using a, uh, small numbers. Now here, for this particular star, if we, which is located one per sec away, the distance in astronomical unit is 206,265. So that's a large number, but we can change it to a one per sec, right? In light years, it will be 3.26 light years. One per sec is 3.26 light years. I believe we have learned this in the, uh, somewhere in the beginning of the semester, but this, this is just a review for you. So typically parallax shift for the near stars less than one arc second. That really tiny and hard to measure. So this method works up to 100 per sec. That's 0 0.01 arc seconds of a uh, parallax shift. Uh, so the brightness of the star depends on both distance and luminosity. So we already heard about it, right? So how do we measure the stellar lumino luminosity? Uh, that's the brightness, right? So as you see here, the stars or the sun-like stars are emitting light all, all way in 365 degrees, right? It's all around, it's emitting light. So these arrows represent the light rays uh, and some of the light rays are reaching to the earth, let's say. Now, so this luminosity is the amount of um, power a star radiates. So energy per second. So we can measure this in watts. Luminosity measured in watts. So um, now, as I mentioned here, the luminosity is the amount of power a star radiates. So star radiates the energy all around it, right, uh, into the space. But the Earth is located somewhere here. It's capturing only a little portion of it. So when we're observing a star from the Earth, we are observing a brightness that we can observe from our eyes. So we call this as the apparent brightness, the amount of starlight that reaches to Earth. So the energy per second per square meter is the unit. So here, if you consider a one square meter area, and if we can measure the energy that reaches to that area in one second is called the apparent brightness. All right, so the, the amount of luminosity that passing through each sphere is the same. So in this figure, I'm referring to this figure. So let's say this is the star and around it, if you draw spheres, these are not circles, spheres, that's 3D circle, right? So 3D balls. So in this case, if you consider the uh, a sphere that located one astronomical unit away, here's the area, right? And then two astronomical units away, there's four of those, four of these squares. Then three astronomical units away, we can fit nine squares over here. But if you think about the, the energy that's emitted from the star, so the, in this area, it's receiving the same um, amount per square meter. Here also, it's receiving the same um, a, a amount of energy in a larger area, right? And over here, again, it's a, the largest area in this picture, and it's receiving the same amount of energy. So the, the amount of luminosity that passing through each sphere is the same. So the area of sphere it can be calculated using this equation, which is four pi radius to the power so power two. So divide divided luminosity by area to grade brightness, right? So you can divide the luminosity by the area to calculate the brightness of the star that we are observing. So the relationship between the apparent brightness and the luminosity depend on the distance. So the brightness is equal to the luminosity of the star divided by four pi distance to the power two. So we can determine a star's luminosity if we can measure its distance and the apparent brightness. 
Here, just modifying this equation, luminosity is equal to 4 phi distance to the power 2, that is basically the area of the sphere of the location of the planet or the Earth, times the brightness. Now, another factor. So if you're talking about the temperatures and the heat, these are two different things. So for example, temperature is a measure of the average speed of particles of a substance. So here, uh, if you are touching a, hot, a coffee cup, and let's say it is really hot, so we, we use the word hot. We don't say that it is, its temperature is high, right? So this hotness is a factor of how the particles in this substance or coffee, the coffee particles are moving. So if it is a really hot one, that means the particles are moving really uh, 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 randomly in, in a fast matter, right? So this is a measure of how fast the amount of materials are moving. Then the heat is, the, is, is different from temperature. Heat indicates the energy that flows from a region of high to low temperature. So if you are closer to a fire, then you will be feeling an energy, a warmness that's uh, travel from the air to your eye. So this is a uh, heat is a measure of energy output. Temperature is a measure of how fast the atoms of a materials are moving. Now, the best example over here is think about a um, flame of a candle. So there are different parts of the candle that, I mean the flame that has different colors, right? All the way as closer to the um, Ropia, it is dark blue, then a light blue, and then it comes the red, kind of uh, yellowish color, right? So here, uh, another example is the burner. So you see this blue color burner. So blue color does have high energy. But when you're talking about luminosity, the red color kind of look bright. But the energy wise, the blue color does contain high energy. So the uh, that very fundamental concept of heat and temperature is giving an amazing application onto stellar system. So colors and temperatures of stars are coming from uh, the, I mean, uh, my apologies, so temperature and the heat gives a different colors to the stars. So here in this picture, you may see a, a constellation. Can you recognize that constellation? So if you look at closely, you see a belt, right? So this is Orion. So this is the, or, uh, the star or, uh, constellation Orion. Uh, so in the Orion, the star Betelgeuse, which is upper left, uh, appear red to the naked eye. So this star over here looks red in color. If you observe this, the constellation, you should be able to see it as in red color. You don't need a telescope. You, you, you should be able to see it really nice red color. Then Rigel, which is lower right star, appears a yellow, uh, kind of white in color. And also uh, some, it's hard to distinguish this whiteness. So it might be a little uh, bluish white color. So those stars. Right, so this, this is the Betelgeuse and that's Rigel. Uh, so the stars are extremely simple objects. Almost all of their properties are determined by their size and the surface temperature. That's it. So it is two simple things, size and the surface temperature. So the surface temperature of a star determines the relative intensities that it emits at different wavelengths and thus its color. The hottest stars emit much of the energy in the ultraviolet and appear to be electric blue, like an arc welder's torch. So the star Cirrus is a good example of a blue star. The coolest stars emit most of their energy in the infrared and it appear in red, like a glowing electric stove element. So the star Betelgeuse in the constellation Orion is a good example of a red star. Here are some typical surface temperatures and apparent colors of stars. So um, the star Delta Orion, its surface temperature is 30,000 Kelvin and its color is bluish in the ultraviolet region. Then the star Rachel is 20,000 
a Kelvin and it's appear blue in ultraviolet. Then Cirrus is 10,000 Kelvin, it is bluish white. Uh, Canopus, it's 7,000 Kelvin and it's yellow and white. Then the sun that we see, it is about 6,000 Kelvin and it's yellowish white. Uh, Arcturus, which is which surface temperature is 4,000 Kelvin, it's peach in color. Betelgeuse, which is 3,000 Kelvin, and it is red in color. Red, but the surface temperature is smaller than the blue color star, Betel Delta Orion. For the hotter stars, the main difference in color are in the ultraviolet that our eye cannot detect. So there are spectral types. So stars are classified according to the, um, their um, appearance of their spectra. So the important variable that determines uh, that appearance is the surface temperature. So before the physicist of light emission was well understood, um, I think I pronounce it incorrectly. So before the physics of light emission was well understood, stars were classified according to their spectra in much way that biologists would classify a species of frogs. So the original classification scheme assigned letters of the alphabet according to the prominence of the emission lines of hydrogen in a star spectrum. Hundreds of thousands of stars were classified according to that scheme. So once it was realized that the important variables is actually not the hydrogen line intensity, but temperature. So they did not rename the types. So here, the, 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 the simply, they means the astronomers rearrange them, arrange from the hottest to the coldest. The important spectral types are uh, O, B, A, F, G, K, M. Each spectral type is now broken up into 10 sub uh, ranges from zero being hottest to nine being coolest. So if you go for an O type star, uh, then the, there are 10 more sub uh, spectral types. So it's O0, O1, up to O9. So O0 being the hottest and O9 being the coolest among the spectral O type. So here, Delta Orion is a O type spectral class. Rigel is a B type, Sirius is A types, likewise Betelgeuse is a M type star. So O, B, A, F, G, K, M. So you see like the, from the spectral class, you may determine their surface temperature. So you can remember these spectral types by other mnemonics for this sequence are, um, too many to remember. So traditional sexiest one is O, B, a fine girl, kiss me, right? So you can remember the spectral types easily. O being the hottest and M being the coolest. So the sun spectra, so in this diagram, you see like um, it's the wavelengths are ranging from a small number to a higher number here. And in the middle, you see the uh, visible light range. Over here it is UV and the other side is infrared. So when you're looking at the sun spectrum, it's actually peaks in the green. So here it's peaks up in the green. We feel like sunlight is emitting a high amount of red light, but it is not. So over here, the peak intensity comes in the uh, green color. So a star actually emits more green light than any other color. But well, wind up seeing it as a white color uh, light. Then the sun puts out more green light than any other color, but our eyes see all the mixed colors together as white. So why it is white? Sun is actually yellow. Not really. The light from the sun is white, but some of the shortest wavelength like purple and blue and some other green get scattered away by molecules of nitrogen in our atmosphere. So the green does not scatter as well as blue. So we see sun as orange kind of red mix. So now let's compare the Procyon and Betelgeuse. And 
uh, two type of stars. So as you see here, prozion is yellow in color, uh, Betelgeuse is red in color. Now, surface temperature of prozion is 6,500 Kelvin. Uh, for Betelgeuse, the surface temperature is 3,300 Kelvin. So as you see, the surface temperature of Betelgeuse is less than that of prozion. Now, luminosity of prozion is 6.9. Can you guess what is the luminosity of Betelgeuse? It will surprise you. It's 120,000. So it's much luminous than prosion. Betelgeuse is much luminous than prosion, but the surface temperature is low. And if you know something about Betelgeuse, Betelgeuse is extremely large. So in this picture, you can compare the sizes. Here's the size of our sun. Then that's the size of Sirius. That's Procyon, then that's Arcturus, and here's the Betelgeuse. So Betelgeuse is the largest among this bunch. So by comparing the luminosity of a star to its surface temperature, we gain a measure of the star's size. Even though the surface temperature is smaller than uh, Betelgeuse compared to Procyon, Betelgeuse have high luminosity because of its size. It has a bigger surface area which can emit um, intensity of light. Well, please answer the questions and then I'll see you in the next video learning about categorizing these stars into HR, using HR diagram, which is the periodic table of stars.